Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we will be doing Rendezvous with Rama, written by Arthur C. Clarke, published in 1973. It has won the Hugo Nebula and the Locus Awards for Best Novel. There is a film that is supposed to be made with Denis Villeneuve as the director. Before we begin, I'd like you to consider subscribing, giving us a like, dropping us a comment, and now let's begin. On June 30th, 1908, a meteorite exploded near the Porkamenanya Tunguska River in Russia. It became known as the Tunguska Event. And then, on February 12th, 1947, another meteorite exploded in the Sikhote Alin Mountains in Russia. The Tunguska meteorite missed Moscow by three hours, while the Sikhote Alin meteorite missed Vladivostok by 270 miles. Then, at 9.46 on the 11th of September in the year 2077, another meteorite hit in northern Italy. More than a million people had their hearing permanently damaged when the meteorite passed through the atmosphere. When it hit the ground, it wiped out the cities of Padua, Verona, and Venice. 600,000 people died, and the damage was more than a trillion dollars. So the Earth united to create Project Space Guard, so that could never happen again. In the year 2131, an object was discovered just outside the orbit of Jupiter. They named it 31439 for the year and order of its discovery. It was calculated to have a diameter of 40 kilometers. Then calculations show that it was on its first and only visit to the solar system. It was a wanderer from the stars. Once they realized that it was a visitor, it was given a name. It was called Rama. At first, they believed that having a rendezvous with Rama would be unlikely because the energy cost would be too great. Astronomers discovered certain puzzling things about Rama. First, there was no variation in its brilliance. That meant that either it was not spinning at all or it was perfectly symmetrical. That problem was not resolved until Dr. William Stenton was able to take the telescope on the far side of the moon to take a look. And his calculations show that it was spinning at more than a thousand kilometers an hour at its equator. So a day on Rama would be only four minutes. So if anything was going to land on Rama, it would have to land only at the poles. So that created a new problem. How was it able to hold itself together against that spin? The Space Advisory Council met and decided that Rama was interesting enough that a space probe should be sent to take a look. So they launched a space probe called CETA from Phobos, the inner moon of Mars. It took seven weeks to get to Rama and it would be the fastest flyby in history. Smaller probes was launched from CETA so that pictures could be taken from all sides of Rama. Once the pictures were beamed back to Earth, it was realized that Rama was not a natural object. It was a cylinder and halfway along the cylinder was a kilometer wide stain or smear where something had hit it once. But whatever had hit it except for the stain didn't seem to cause any other damage and it was 50 kilometers from end to end. One piece of information that was gained from Rama's gravitational field was that it had to be hollow. This was to be the first alien encounter from the stars. The endeavor under Commander Norton was placing asteroid warning beacons and checking them when they got the order to rendezvous with Rama. Three other solar survey ships were ordered to give their fuel to the Endeavour so that they could make their run towards Rama. When the Endeavour got to Rama, it landed on the north pole of the cylinder that is Rama. Commander Norton chose not to land on the airlock but between two of the three pill shaped structures that will keep the Endeavour from sliding off Rama. Rama was already on the inside orbit of Venus when Endeavour caught up to it. Because of the speed that Rama was going through the solar system with, the Endeavour would be the only ship that the Earth would be able to send to it. Once the Endeavour landed, they would have about three weeks before they would be forced to leave Rama. And when the Endeavour left Rama, it would be on a trajectory headed out of the solar system. But they were told not to worry because they would be sent tankers that will refuel the Endeavour to help it get back to Earth. 
but Commander Norton knew that getting information from Rama was a prize worth a suicide mission, and if it came to it, Endeavour and her crew was expendable. After waiting for 24 hours, Commander Norton and Lieutenant Commander Carl Mercer went on their first EVA. After examining the Endeavour to make sure it didn't take any damage, Norton went to the nearest pillbox to take a look at it. On the pillbox, he found six radial grooves that were deeply recessed into the metal, and lying in them were six crossed bars like the spokes of a rimless wheel with a small hub in the center. He was able to pull out that little wheel and he was surprised because he thought it would have been frozen solid. He had the endeavor check to see if it detected anything, but it didn't. At first they were unable to turn the wheel, but they got it to turn once they began turning it in the opposite direction. As they turned the wheel, the wall of the pillbox started to open up and the road to Rama lay open. The Rama committee was small and based on the moon. It consisted of United Planets representatives from Mercury, Earth, Luna, Ganymede, Titan, and Triton. There were also three specialists on the committee. Professor Davidson, which was an astronomer, Dr. Thelma Price, who was an archaeologist, and Carlisle Pereira, an exobiologist. Dennis Solomons, the science historian, and the historian Sir Lewis Sands, who were telecommuting from Earth, and Dr. Bowes, who was the ambassador from Mars to the United Planets. And they were together to advise Commander Norton when necessary. They went over Commander Norton's qualifications. They then discussed the possible scenarios that Commander Norton would find inside of Rama. And they reached a consensus that since Commander Norton already opened the first door, he must proceed and go into Rama. Commander Norton sent a message to his wives, one on Mars and one on Earth, detailing what he had done so far. He explained that they went through three airlocks, one after the other, into a corridor that was half a kilometer long. At the end of the corridor, there was another series of three airlocks. They've gone through the first two airlocks and they are waiting at the third one, waiting for permission from Earth to go through into Rama itself. It seems that the Ramanians did everything in threes. So far, they haven't heard any sound or any hint of activity. He then sent a message off to his wives. They opened the final airlock and Commander Norton went in and it was totally dark in there. There was no glimmer of light and nothing reflected back his beam. Sensors told them that the far wall was tens of kilometers away. When he had drifted to the end of his line, he turned around and looked at the wall through which he came. He was hovering over the center of a small crater, which itself was inside the base of a larger one, and on either side rose a complex of terraces and ramps. And about a hundred meters away, he could see the exit to the other two airlock systems identical to this one. He threw out a flare and then timed it so that when it went off, he could take a picture. The cavern he was in was at least 10 kilometers wide and of an indefinite length. In the quick glimpse that the flare gave him, he tried to memorize everything that he saw. He was the first human to look upon the works of an alien civilization. After launching five long laid flares down the cylinder, they were able to take good photographs and map most of the main features. The inside of the cylinder was 50 kilometers long and 16 kilometers wide. The two ends were bowl shaped and they were calling the end they were in the northern hemisphere. There was a central hub and radiating away from the central hub 120 degrees apart was three ladders that were almost a kilometer long. The ladders ended on a plateau that ran completely around the bowl and from there there were three stairways that led down to the plain below. They named the stairways Alpha, Beta and Gamma. Each stairway had an estimated 20 to 30,000 steps and were not continuous but had five circular terraces but the southern hemisphere looked entirely different. It had no stairways and no central hub. In the center there was a huge spike that was kilometers long with six smaller ones around it and no one knew what it was for. The central section between the two bowls they called the central plain. It was 50 kilometers long and they call it the plane because if they were standing down on it, it would seem flat. 
The most striking feature of the central plain was a 10 kilometer wide dark band running completely around it at the halfway mark. It looked like ice, so they christened it the Cylindrical Sea. And in the middle, there was a large oval island that was about 10 kilometers long and 3 kilometers wide, covered with tall structures, and they called it New York. They don't think it's a city, they think it's a factory of some kind. They've also located what looked like at least six cities. If they were built for humans, they would hold about 50,000 people. They decided to call them Rome, Peking, Paris, Moscow, London, Tokyo. And they seem to be linked by some kind of rail system. They have 4,000 kilometers to explore and only a few weeks to do it in. The two questions they're trying to answer is who were they and what went wrong? Back on the moon, the Rama committee began to debate what Rama was. They came to the conclusion that Rama is a space arc, just like those that have been proposed by many scientists on Earth in the past. The other consensus they came to was that Rama had been traveling for a very long time, possibly millions of years, and that it was aimed at the solar system. The last time it passed close to a star was 200,000 years ago, and that was a star that was unsuitable for life. And they also came to the conclusion that the Raminians must be dead because in their belief there was no way that the biological systems could last that long inside of Rama. They estimate that it would deteriorate after 10,000 years at the most. But one question at least has been answered. Humans were not alone. The men that were going to go exploring was Lieutenant Commander Carl Mercer, an expert in life support systems, and his partner, Lieutenant Joe Calvert. Both of these men shared a wife. The third member of the team would be Technical Sergeant Willard Myron, who was a mechanical genius. If anyone could figure out how the systems on Rama work, it would be him. They would be carrying over 100 kilos of equipment and life support gear. They began climbing the nearest ladder down to the plane head first. At the 500 rung, they swung around so that they would be going down feet first. They finally got to the platform where the ladder ended and the stairway began. After a bit of studying, they decided the best way to go down the stairs was to slide down on the handrail. When they had reached about two kilometers down, they discovered that the air was breathable. Then they began their way back up, bounding up the stairs. This was just a test to see how they would go down and how they would come back up. They reached the platform where the ladder began and began climbing up. Their excursion had lasted just under an hour and they were back at their starting point. Once they had returned to the ship, they were examined by Sergeant Commander Laura Ernst who declared them in good health, but Will was a little out of shape. Then Commander Norton and Laura discussed plans for the next trip that will go all the way down to the Central Plain, and they both signed off on it. There were four monkeys on board the Endeavour that were called Super Chimps. They were blacky, blondy, goldy, and browny, and they were not chimpanzees. They were old and new world monkeys that had synthetic genes spliced into them. They were clones and they were sexless, they were docile, obedient and uninquisitive and they did work that freed up humans to do other things. They had an IQ of about 60, couldn't talk because it was impossible to give them proper vocal cords. So they communicated in sign language. And while everyone on the crew knew basic signs, only one man was fluent, their handler, Chief Steward McAdams. And since it was impossible to teach them to use spacesuits, they would have to be killed if the ship was ever to be abandoned, and that would fall on the medical officer. Commander Norton was pleased that that wasn't his responsibility, because he would have trouble killing Goldie, which was his favorite. When Norton and his group slid down to the second level, they discarded their oxygen gear. The one thing that puzzled Norton was that everything in Rama looked brand new. There was no wear and tear on anything. They used the stairs for the last kilometer, and when they finally reached, they were eight kilometers away from where they started. The other two men that were with Commander Norton was Lieutenant Joe Calvert and Lieutenant Boris Rodrigo. Once they got permission from the dock, they decided to head for the nearest town that they called Paris. It was eight kilometers away. On their way to Paris, they made one detour, and that was to see 
a feature that they call the Strait Valley. It was a long trench that was 40 meters deep and 100 meters wide. There was three of them and they were equally spaced along the curve of Rama. They were all 10 kilometers long and they all stopped just before they reached the sea. And on the other side of the sea, they began again. When they got to it, the walls were smooth and had an angle of 60 degrees. And at the bottom, there was a sheet of flat white material that looked like ice. Commander Norton decided to get a sample of it. But it wasn't ice, it was some kind of transparent crystal. He hammered it, but it didn't cause any damage, so he couldn't get a piece of it. So eventually, he had them pull him back up, and they continued on their way to Paris. The Rama committee met because Dr. Pieta got some information he wanted to impart to them. And before they turned it over to him, and they decided to go over what they thought they knew before passing it on to him. And it seems that the buildings in the city of Paris are all the same size and no doors or windows. There is a single groove in the street that goes into the building, but that's it. Some of the scientists believe that this is a method of cocooning where you place something in storage until you are ready to use it at a later time. It would seem that Commander Norton is headed to the cylindrical sea and he has another group set up a supply base at the foot of Stereo Alpha. It seems he wants to have at least two exploration missions going at the same time. But Dr. Piera said that this is not going to work. He is advising for an immediate alert and preparation for total withdrawal at 12 hours notice. He warns them that as Rama which is now inside the orbit of Venus, gets closer to the sun, it will begin warming up and that will create hurricanes inside of Rama. There were now 20 people inside of Rama. Six of them were down on the plane and the rest were ferrying equipment up through the airlock system. The endeavor was almost deserted. The first team to head to the cylindrical sea was Sergeant Commander Laura Ernst, who was in charge, then there was Lieutenant Boris Rodrigo and Sergeant Peter Rousseau. Once they got to the sea, they realized that the cliff on their side was only 50 meters, but the cliff on the southern side was 500 meters. And in the sea was an island, and on the island was the structures that they called New York. They didn't think it was a city at all. They found a flight of stairs that led down to the sea. And with permission, they went down to take a look. When they stepped on the sea, they realized it was ice. They struck it and collected pieces. They headed back to the hub with their sample. Meanwhile, back on the moon, Dr. Piero was explaining how the hurricanes on Rama is going to come about. And when it does, there will be wind speeds of maybe between 200 and 300 kilometers an hour. Meanwhile, Commander Norton was responding to his wives, explaining that the two cities they have explored were not cities at all. Paris looked like a storage depot, while London was filled with cylinders that were linked together by pipes that were connected to pumping stations, and everything was sealed. That's when he got a message from the Rama committee warning him of the sudden onset of 200 kilometer winds. He, of course, did not take them very seriously at first, but then he realized that in the past hour, he had felt a very slight breeze. So he sent an answer back to them requesting the meaning of the phrase, sudden onset. Most of the people in Rama was asleep when they heard the noise. It sounded as if Rama was splitting open and tearing itself apart. It was the sound of the ice breaking up. The sea had melted from the bottom up. Then he began to feel a strong breeze. It was time to get his people out of there. They were almost back to the hub when light burst upon Rama. Now that everything was lit, the view was overwhelming and he made sure that all of his people were okay. The light was coming from those six trenches and it was blue. So it seems that Rama's sun was hotter than ours. So now the next problem was who or what had switched on the lights. And just before he went through the airlock, he saw a mist rising from the sea. It was tilted sharply in the direction of Rama's spin. The first tropical storm was beginning. Back at the Rama committee, the ambassador for Mercury is now voicing concerns that now that Rama is at the very least being guided by some sort of robotic force, that they should be prepared in case it has malevolent intentions. 
The ambassador of Mercury went on to say that before they could know how dangerous it is, they must know if Rama has a propulsion system. Dr. Piera then said that the only place that a propulsion system could be would be at the southern end where no one has been able to get to yet because it's across the sea. He goes on to say that if we can prove that Rama has a space drive, even if we learn nothing about its mode of operation, it would be a major discovery. At least we know that such a thing is possible. And while Dr. Piera was explaining that, it suddenly came to him. Rama must have a propulsion system because it would explain why the southern cliffs of the sea was higher than the northern cliffs of the sea. The propulsion must be on the southern end and when it is active, it will be pushing the Rama cylinder towards the northern end and that cliff would keep the sea from slashing out. The ambassador to Mercury now wants Commander Norton to go to the southern continent to see pinpoint this propulsion system because no one knows what Rama's intent is and by the time they figure it out it may be too late. This is the end of part one. We will be doing part two in an upcoming video. I'd like to thank everyone for watching and listening and I would appreciate it if you drop us a comment, leave us a like and subscribe and I will see you in the next video.